Welcome to Leader IQ, where we share the stories of leaders in brand and retail so you can learn what led them to find success in their careers while giving you an intimate look at how they made foundational decisions along the way. This show is hosted by Guru Hari Haran, who is the founder and CEO of Commerce IQ. Guru has spent most of his career working as a leader at companies like Amazon and eBay before becoming an entrepreneur himself. This podcast is brought to you by Commerce IQ, a company which Guru started in 2019 that has become the e-commerce operating system for brands like Logitech, Johnson & Johnson, Kellogg's, Mars, Duracell, and many more. If you're interested in learning more, check out commerceiq.ai. With that, let's get to the show. Today's guest is Don Hudson. She is most well-known for her most recent stint as CMO of the NFL. But behind the scenes, she's advised leaders sitting on multiple boards of companies like Lowe's and NVIDIA. We dive deep into her personal story of her early years in marketing, covering memorable stories from her time at Pepsi in the NFL, as well as covering what she's spending time on today. Here is Don Hudson and our host, Guru Hari Haran, and special guest host, Ray Chow. Um, so, um, so, yeah. There's a story that you might not come on to, but um, I think in the spirit of sort of transparency and, and talking about the human side of people, um, after I left PepsiCo, intending to run another big company, I started, it was 2008, which is, it turned out was not a great time for lots of job opportunities. And given at the time I had a package goods background, now I probably have more of a sports and entertainment background, but at the time, packaged goods, there weren't a ton of packaged goods companies in New York. So I was talking, was interviewing, I did some more boards. I started to interview for the CEO of Dunkin' Donuts, which was based mm. in Boston. And mm -hmm. I, I was born and raised in Boston, so certainly very familiar to me. Not tremendously far from New York, but there were three private equity firms at the time that owned Dunkin' Donuts. And um, so I, it, it was like a year, I'm not kidding you, a year of interviewing. And I knew the, um, the CEO who wanted to be the outgoing CEO and he was looking for who could succeed me and he knew me. And so we had a great relationship, but now the private equity firms had to get to know me. And so they went from, and of course they had to, okay, this is the guy John Luther wants. This is the woman that John Luther wants, but now let's expand the search. Okay, mm. 12 candidates. Now we come down, now we come down. They were about to go from four down to two. And I was one of those two and I felt pretty good about the job. And um, I started to, at this point, it'd been a year of my life. I had been working such, PepsiCo is definitely a long hour place. And um, my oldest daughter was going to college and my younger daughter uh, was in middle school. And I started to appreciate in that year what it was like to um, you know, see her more, spend time with her, not get home and after dinner's been had and, and, and get out without being able to drop her off at school. And I started to appreciate the little things in life that you just don't get when you're working all the time. And even though you try to prioritize your kids, there's just some of those little things in life that you can't make up for. So after a year of this, I started to kind of re-examine my priorities. And I said, you know, wait a minute, I've been Fortune 50 woman, CEO of five and a half billion dollar company. What do I really have to prove? Do I really want to go do this? And I was also starting to think more health and wellness, and do I want to get into something more innovative? Anyway, I, it was probably one of the hardest calls I've ever made to call up the then CEO and just say, you know, too much time has passed and, I, and I'm, I've decided I don't want the job. Hmm. And um, I had a, 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 an older mentor, a woman by the name of Ann Fudge, uh, also uh, 50 most powerful women. And she told me, she said, Dawn, think about how you'll feel if you turn them down versus how you feel if you get the job. And if you think that you're gonna feel better turning them down, go out on your, do it, go out on your porch, look out at the yard, take a deep breath and you will know you do the right thing. And I certainly did and it led to a more entrepreneurial, a more varied, uh, a more, a, a different life. And I think that young people are better than 
people of my generation at this, but we tend to get on a treadmill. And if you run a $2 billion, comp billion dollar company, you want to run a $4 billion. Then you want to run a $6 billion. Then you got to be your, your CEO of a division. Then you got to be CEO of the company. And I think it's about all total life. And it's about how everything works. And I think that people today, and as I've learned and look back in my career, I would have balanced more what the, the job, not only what the job was and the opportunities for me, but what was the lifestyle it would afford me. Anyway, I, I just gave you the story, but if you want to No, this is, I think we don't, we don't need to actually, we'll, we'll use this. So okay. um, I think maybe just to, to build on that, and Guru's going to then jump into some of the questions on the early parts of your career. But I'm curious, as, as you went through that journey, how did you change the way you worked, um, given that you started appreciating, you know, spending more time with, with the kids and, and um, you know, did that change how you approached your schedule and, and how you incorporated family more into it or, definitely, and look? You know, definitely what, what I did when I said no to Dunkin' Donuts is at the time I had joined um, a board called Allergan Pharmaceuticals that I really loved. And um, so I was on Lowe's Home Improvement, I was on Allergan and I was on Interpublic Group. Uh, no, I hadn't joined Interpublic Group then. So I was on two boards. And, um, and then I thought, well, what else can I do? Uh, you know, I, I'm relatively new to these boards. I don't think it's right to drop off. And if I don't want to do a, a full-time CEO thing, what could I do? And so I thought about, and it was an odd choice for someone who'd run a company before, but not for me because I started my career in advertising, which was a service business. And so I really thought about consulting because here's something that would take advantage of my knowledge. When I was in advertising, I worked across quite a range of categories from, from personal care to laundry and detergents to, to water and beverages to real estate. And I had quite a perspective. And what was fun about that is to kind of share insights from one category to another. So I decided to, to join a consulting firm and I interviewed a few. And the one that I liked the most was uh, I interviewed them, they interviewed me was a group called Parthenon, which was a, a spinoff from Bain, but was run uh, by an individual named Bill Lockmeyer that I really, really uh, respected. But it was run as work hard, play hard. First, family comes first, that's what you prioritize. So I, I had an office in Boston, but I worked the majority of the time when you're consulting, you're wherever your clients are. So I either was traveling to see them or I was on the phone. Uh, we weren't Zooming. Uh, we could do video conference. We weren't doing Zoom, but it was uh, it was a far more flexible way to work, and I don't think it in any way detracted from my relationship with my team. Most of our time we spent on the road. Many of our clients were in New York, so that was nice. Of course, I I tried to make that happen, um, but it did. And and what it did say to me too is that I could be quite fulfilled by not having to do one company full time. And, you know, I think I had the luxury in my career. I mean, it's, I think when you're starting out, you kind of have to focus on one and you've got to show what you can do and you have to prove yourself and you have to gain knowledge and then maybe you go to another company. But at some point, you have the ability to pick and choose. And rather than been pigeonholed into only doing one thing, what I love about my life today is it's so intellectually diverse and way more personal time too, because I'm serving on three public company boards, one private board. I'm, I'm chairing a startup. I'm, I'm um, um, advising a PE, uh, a, a startup PE private equity firm. And it, it just hits my brain in so many different ways, exposes me to a much broader set of people. Honestly, I think in some ways I'm better because I'm cross fertilizing different things I lead, uh, I, I learn in different areas. So, uh, Again, I, I think that you know you have to build your career and I and mentor a lot of millennials, but I do think the younger generations, I'm not sure I had the luxury to do that when I started out because it was a it was a dog eat dog world and, and women had to prove themselves more uh, than men, um, you know, similar to diverse individuals. Um, and and so you sort of had to to get on that treadmill and prove and try to claw your way up and break the glass ceiling. But I think there's many more options today. And I think people in, in general are more respectful of what works for you personally. Yeah. I've had a couple of situations that accent that for me uh, recently. Um, 
I'm on a board of a company where uh, we tried to hire, and I'm chairman of the compensation committee. So we needed to hire a new um, chief personnel officer. And uh, the company is based in San Francisco and he couldn't find the right, very, very, very tough market, lots, lots of job opportunities. We couldn't find the right person. And so the person we wanted had two girls in high school and didn't feel able at that time to move to San Francisco. So we said, well, why don't we try each other out for a year? Maybe you'll think differently after you've worked with us for a year. And then COVID happened and everybody was remote. Well, now he's joined permanently and he's staying in, in Chicago because it's a, it's a new way of working. And my, um, my niece just had a baby in October and she took five months of maternity leave and she's the primary wage earner of the couple. And she went back to work and she went back to work three days a week, you know, what works for her um, uh, with her son. And a week later she gets promoted. Uh, so, you know, she does her job. She does her job well. She does it on her terms and she's promoted to vice president. So you love to hear those stories where, where work respects capabilities and contributions and finds a way to make it work for the individual. Yeah, and even so, I think, I, I think I was going to say with the, with the pandemic now hitting us, it's, uh, it's become a lot more clearer that these sort of things, your ability to uh, to uh, get down to it, do the right things, move the ball helps a lot more than say other um, uh, the opinions or the corporate politics and things like that. It's definitely put the put the light on the right things <laughs> that yeah. need to be on. I'm um, working with a group of women that I worked with at PepsiCo uh, to write a book. We we've been doing a lot of these women's functions and. Uh, we laugh about the things that happened to us at PepsiCo earlier and on in our years. And then each of us left since 2010 and have gone on to do other things at a, at a variety of very interesting companies. But we came back to write a book on these little awkward moments in business that uh, were difficult for us that don't seem to be that different. They seem to be more subtle, but they don't seem to be that different. So we're writing a book. Anyway, wrote, wrote an article um, that we're trying to get published right now on exactly this pandemic issue. Because it's, mm. as I sit across multiple companies, I see such a variation in how the companies, some companies, I would say more traditional companies, are thinking through a lens of, well, and the NFL is probably the most traditional because they already had everybody back at work since last June. But you've got some that are saying, I'm trying to get back in the office. Yes, I'm going to try to conserve my office space. But the office becomes the, the core and you try to see how much you can maximize that. And others that are saying, oh, how do I make this as flexible work for my employees as possible? And that'll create a better culture and that culture will attract better talent. So anyway, the article is about really, as you're thinking about coming back from the pandemic, don't just think logistically of how much space you have, how much you want to afford, how you're going to get people in two days a week, what you're going to do. Think about what's the culture. You have an opportunity to, you know, up the ante on your culture to really think about what works for you and what works for the kind of talent you have in your company and that, that you want to attract. So I think it's a really interesting time for companies and those that sort of just instinctively go back to the status quo. And I do see some sort of leaning that way. I feel bad because I think they're missing an opportunity. That's a really interesting, yeah, it's a really interesting question, uh, point that you make, Don. And on that note, maybe, you know, uh, I'm now curious, like maybe we can unpack that a little bit more um, in back in the day, you talked about um, female leaders growing up in uh, the corporate ladder, ladder in uh, PepsiCo. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about how, um, how that experience was and did gender at that point impact your progress in your career and and how did you um, how did you, how did you respond to that? Well, uh, PepsiCo, um, I was lucky. I was hired by two terrific men. I was hired by Roger Enrico, who was CEO of the company and who is a real uh, a real innovator, a real visionary. You know, believed if anything was worth doing, it was worth doing right, and he did a lot of tremendous, he, he had the job that I had before me, he ran uh, Pepsi and he got, you know, deals with Michael Jackson and he got the, the company into music marketing and he got the company kind of reestablished as a, as a youth brand that it hadn't been. And then you have Steve Reinemann who came 
out of food service and join and who's running Frito-Lay and they both hired me. And um, at the time when I was hired, most people would have described PepsiCo as an extreme male culture, mm -hmm. a fraternity culture, a culture where, you know, uh, <laughs> we had something called uh, Raj and Rico liked Sambuca. So it was called, we're going on Sambuca patrol. And the idea is you'd stay up really late, you tell a lot of corporate stories, and trust me, you heard corporate stories that you didn't hear during the day. And people would drink a lot of alcohol. And one time I was pregnant with our second child, about seven months pregnant, I was uh, going to fly fishing school in an outward bound kind of a PepsiCo program. And Roger was there and that night we went on Sambuca patrol. Well, it was really interesting going on Sambuca patrol, unable to drink alcohol because the jokes and everything you're laughing about just weren't quite as funny. Uh, and it was more of a challenge to stay up that late. But that that was the culture. It was, you know, after work, uh, shoot hoops. It was uh, be seen at the office at eight or nine at night. Whoever's seen there is better. Uh, the bottling company system, I started with Frito-Lay, then I switched to Pepsi. There were uh, a little over 100 bottlers when I joined. All of them were men except one. So it was. But, but for me, it didn't feel all that unusual because I went to Dartmouth College at a time where it was only 10% women. So I was used to that. Uh, I grew up sort of competing in sports. I love sports. My father was one of four boys in a professional baseball playing family. So while he didn't play professionally, he was just, they were always outdoorsy and sportsy. And he had three daughters. I was the oldest. I became his sports buddy. So I was brought up to be very comfortable. You know, I, I could talk football. I could talk baseball. I could play golf. I could beat people at tennis. I, I could... Uh, I could enter their world and feel feeling comfortable where I think a lot of other women would not have felt comfortable in that world. But it's still, it was something when Steve Reinemann became CEO, um, everybody, I think CEOs have a, and we'll talk about what I've learned in my career, but I think the best CEOs have a, a, a one or two things that they think are going to make a really big difference for that corporation. And they focus on that. And for Steve Reinemann, it was understanding where the talent in the future was going to come and recognizing if we didn't break this fraternity culture at PepsiCo, we were really not going to be able to have the talent that we needed long term to drive the company. And PepsiCo was, a, was you know, always had, it still does, ter terrific talent. So he formed affinity groups. I ran the women of color group. He really worked hard. He tried to break some of these uh, uh, things that would normally happen. And, and so it was really actually very rewarding uh, to be a part of that. That said, you know, I became head of a bottling business with, you know, a, you know, a hundred male bottlers to work with. So luckily my golf helped out. They ended up inviting me on their male only, you know, golfing outings. And I, I uh, had shot a gun before, but I'd never been pheasant hunting, so I went and did that. And uh, so it was comfortable for me. I will tell you why I think I succeeded at PepsiCo in part is two things. Uh, one, having come from a service background, and there's something really good to be said for service, because when it comes to sharing ideas, if you work for an ad agency or you work for a consulting firm, or you work for a technology advisory firm. You can have the greatest ideas in the world, but if you can't share them and let others take them on as, your, as their ideas and support them to make them happen, it's really kind of frustrating for you because nothing that you do happens. And that idea of leading through others was critically important to a bottling business that doesn't want to be told what to do. And but frankly, the way the bottling business worked at that time it's been integrated since then, uh, is that the uh, two publicly held companies that bottled Pepsi separate from the brand company, and you had a whole host of smaller bottlers. And if you had an innovation idea, and I had like a really unique package I wanted to put out there, I had to convince the bottling system that it'd be worth their investment of capital, their investment of time to refit their manufacturing facilities in order to be able to go and do that innovation. 
So you couldn't command and control. So, so people that came to PepsiCo from, you know, large multinational command and control places had a lot of difficulty because you couldn't come in and do that. So I think that served me well. And I also think something about being a woman is to ask questions is there's, you know, I don't want to stereotype it, but there's a softer side, but I really made it my business to go out and spend time in the market with their families. These smaller bottlers were family owned businesses, sometimes started by grandfathers, sometimes passed on to grandsons. And whether they were going to sell or not had less to do about whether they were earning $50,000 more or less in a given year and more about was there someone else in the family that wanted to run the business. And so really putting family first and getting to know them got them, I believe, to trust me. So when I wanted to get the system to do something very difficult, and I'll describe to you what's one of the, hard, I think the hardest thing I've ever done at PepsiCo, um, I was able to rely on that trust. I wasn't just a corporate, you know, profit seeking um, monologue telling them what to do and, um, and, and what, what it led to is the Coca-Cola system was a far more consolidated bottling system. And what that meant is that there were fewer bottlers to get aligned to what you needed to do. So even if it was a price deal with Walmart, they could get alignment faster. You know, if I wanted to come out with, you know, $3.99 special on 4th of July, we'd have to use the sales organization to get 100 bottlers to say yes to that price point. And if you're a smaller bottler, without the economies of scale, you're actually going to lose money on that deal. And in some cases, more than you could do it. And as Walmart got bigger, Walmart started to be less and less tolerant of the fact that two markets to the PepsiCo system weren't going to hit that, that price point in those stores. So what, working with, with a whole team, we decided we needed to do is we needed to put procurement for all of our bottlers under one organization. And obviously, the big bottlers would dominate that because they've been doing procurement in a very sophisticated way. But the smaller bottlers would distrust the larger bottlers to, to prioritize their... You told me to turn that off and I didn't. Um, anyway, back to the, the smaller bottlers would uh, not be able to afford some of these. And so uh, they did want economies of scale, but if there was like say an aluminum shortage, their fear was cans would be made and cans would get delivered to the bigger bottlers first, the smaller bottlers second. So they didn't trust getting, getting uh, procurement, getting all of their supplies, their cardboard, their aluminum, their syrup, their sugar uh, from a central location. And it was gonna save the bottling system $50 million a year, a, a lot of money. And it would disproportionately go to the smaller bottlers. That was the hardest 50 million I ever had to give away. And it really had to be, how can we set up an organizational structure? How can I listen to your issues around fearing that you'll be snuffed out by the big guys and put a series of uh, procedures in place that make you feel comfortable? And it took like 15 months to just put that document together. But we got it done. And I, and I think it had to do with, with looking at these people individually as partners and as families trying to do the best for their communities as opposed to a number and a dot on a page and a certain set of revenue. Well, that's a great example of um, how uh, you were able to change some decisions and make some meaningful decisions for your partners in being um, in a leadership role. Can you talk a little bit about your about uh, any stories that come to your mind in terms of um, from a board perspective? Uh, we are starting to see a movement to have diversity on boards. Curious, and you've been on board since what 2001, and I'm um, curious how you've seen the journey of, um, uh, of say, the boards taking decisions, and how this decision that um, uh, the policy that is currently being ma uh, made in terms of include being more inclusive, having more diversity on the boards, um, has some ground footing. Uh, a lot of uh, CEOs listening to the to the podcast would love to just get a story or two in terms of how some of the decision-making changes when you have a balanced viewpoint? Well, you know, I think almost any business school, top business school in the country has done studies that show that if you put a diverse group of people and you define diversity in the broadest sense, international experience, domestic experience, race, sex, 
engineering background, marketing background, whatever. But the more diverse a group you can put together against a problem, the faster you'll get a good solution that'll change the business. It's just, it's just proven again and again that having different perspectives, if you've got a culture where people listen to those perspectives, right? Because if diversity doesn't work unless there's a culture of openness yeah. and receptivity to it. But I think it's been proven time and time again, and it's one of the reasons that corporate America too, I think, is doing well, is it has a much more diverse workforce, particularly at the at the middle and junior levels. So when you look at a board, a boards boards have been out of step with what's been happening in, in corporate America, and and why that is, I think, is that it's a, a they, some call it an oil old boys club, but the notion is when you get on a board then the people you're on the board with will introduce you to other boards and you'll get other board positions that way. So if you're a male, a white male, and you get on a board, the white guys are going to introduce you and all of a sudden you just have a proliferation of, of men getting other opportunities. And women and diverse candidates often hit the, you know, have, have you had board experience before? So uh, what I would tell you is I'm, I'm lucky, interpublic group, now the advertising industry is notoriously behind the curve in terms of, of, of total diversity. They do pretty well on the women front, um, not necessarily at the senior levels, uh, but when you look at diversity, they, they really have a difficult time recruiting. And often when they do recruit, they get stolen by the clients because it's uh, there just aren't as many diverse candidates. So they really dedicated themselves, they saw this opportunity as clients prioritize more, not only diverse workforces, but diverse business development and, and diverse procurement, they felt that there was a real opportunity to separate themselves from the other holding companies by making diversity more of a core uh, belief. And so when I joined the Interpublic Board, I was the fourth woman on the board. And we had one uh, woman of color on the board as well. So I was really lucky, and, and what I saw in that board is that it just automatically, it just worked. It, had, it just, it was already diverse. It, it was a culture in the company that supported diversity. And, and I can compare and contrast that with Lowe's. I love my Lowe's experience, but I was the first woman to be recruited to the board of Lowe's. And, and on my interview was to go to the stores, wear a red jacket, and go around and, you know, talk to customers. And... Luckily, you know, my father thought that one of the best things he could do for his daughters was teach them uh, household skills. So I know how to rotate tires. I, you know, I can do a lot of carpentry. I, I don't touch electrical, but um, I had that experience. So when I go into Lowe's, oh yeah, I mean, I'm really comfortable there. I, I, that, that may have contributed, but Lowe's since added while I was on the board, more women, but it was really interesting. I, I was very, um, um, very feeling welcome, but, but not really. And I, at the time I was on the board, I was on the board of the LPGA. So they often ask me questions about what's going on in the world of golf. And then I became chairman of the board of the LPGA. Um, and uh, cause you can get questions on golf. And yet our meetings were Thursday afternoon and Friday morning. And there was always at least four of the guys that would go out and play golf after the board meeting and in my 14 years on the board i was never invited to go on the golf game afterwards now i think they thought oh she's flying home to new york she's got two daughters she made they made an assumption that was a wrong assumption and they would always say oh we can't wait to play golf with you but it never happened mm -hmm. so that that's one where i think if it had more women on the board and more diversity maybe maybe it would have been more feeling like you were socially part of it in, in addition to business but, you know, I put that aside. It was a great board experience. So what I do want to share is one of the challenges boards have when they're bringing on diverse people is the, the requirement that most boards have that a person has board experience. So because I know that's the case, when people come to me who are qualified and say, I'd like to get on a board, I sell them, well, first, Think of a really good industry board or something in the private in, in the not-for-profit sector where you can get, if you can, leadership experience running a committee. Secondly, maybe you can get on a board in private equity where your experience in a particular industry is directly relevant. So that even though you haven't had public company board experience, you can say you've had board experience. But 
because public companies so often have a requirement that you have served on another public company, and I think the reason they do that is they think that the shareholders will be more supportive of that, but it really limits their field of opportunity. And I went on the board of Lowe's. I never had any public board experience. I would run a couple of associations within, and I was on the board of the LPGA. So I had that experience, but they took a risk on me and I think it worked out for them. And I, I think of NVIDIA and NVIDIA is a board where I was the first woman on the board and, and Jensen Wang, phenomenal leader, uh, is a real pulse on diversity. And when he saw, you know, he was building his board and he was putting more diversity on, not exclusively, you know, we we're continuing to rotate our board, but he said, we don't have an African-American on the board. We really need to get one when, when the George, uh, I'll just say when, when, when Minneapolis had all the problems, because it's still Minneapolis having problems, unfortunately. Um, he said, you know, we just have to take this to heart as a company. And we have a very tremendous individual on our board now who's from Caltech, a professor who un understands the technology better than any of us in the room who are venture capitalists or run companies. Um, and so the questions he asks are so interesting and so different. But Jensen took a risk. This is a guy he met who he knew would be a good board member. He was young. He was diverse. He didn't have any board experience. We all have, you know, we got on the phone with him ahead of time, talked to him, he got training. He's terrific. So I think, I think boards, as they seek to have more diversity, are going to have to be a little bit more flexible. Otherwise, you're going to get the same group of people just recycled across more and more companies, as opposed to really bringing some new thinking onto corporate boards. Um, Don, I was just going to ask, so maybe going deeper into some of the tactics that you've used to, to get onto boards and, and how you, I mean, you've an expansive board experience that's that's you know in various industries but curious with with Lowe's at the time um you know how did you position yourself to, to even get that opportunity to even be considered um let alone them placing the bet on you like was it by chance or did you go to a recruiter an executive search firm like how, how did that unfold it was by chance I was lucky you know I was in my early 40s Lowe's hired a headhunting firm to find a woman uh to go on the board and so they approached me and I, at the time, I hadn't even been, I was head of marketing for Pepsi. I wasn't running the division yet. And I uh, hadn't really thought about a public board. And so I went to my um, two levels up, boss Steve Reinemann to ask him, geez, I got this call, would this be possible? And again, it was early on in my, relatively early on in my career. And he said to me, he said, Dawn, this is fantastic. You should definitely go for this role because uh, you will learn so much from seeing the inner workings of another company, you'll make us at PepsiCo better. And he was so right. I mean, I learned things about leadership that I was able to apply to my job when I, I then ran the division that um, I, you know, I got through lows and seeing something differently. And so PepsiCo had a philosophy that their senior leaders should serve on one outside, not two or three, that too is time consuming, but one outside board. So the fact that they gave me permission, the fact that um, the head editor called me, the fact that he happened, I think it was a man, uh, that he happened to find somebody who happened to love home improvement, personally doing it yourself, uh, that made me a fit. So I, you know, I, Interesting. I don't know how many of the others they talked to, but um, anyway. And I remember sending them a note, because you know, when you're, when you're on a board, and you get a, a job change, whether you leave a company, go to another one, or you get promoted, you have to then notify the company and they have to decide, geez, with this new role, you know, can you still serve? Goes to the governance committee. So I called them up and I, I sent them a note. I've been, I've been promoted to president of the division. And they wrote me back something like, we knew it. We picked you. We knew you were going to go big places. So they were like my biggest cheerleader. Very, very That's nice. Awesome. And, and after the Lowe's experience, I mean, at what point did you start to sort of proactively identify additional board opportunities and, and what tactics did you use to either get your, your name out there? Um, did you use firms? Did you, was it through relationships? How did that unfold over the years? Uh, it was really, if I, if I think about it, uh, it was headhunting firms. And I think when I left Pepsi, they had a, a senior female leader who 
had public company experience with corporations wanting more diversity on their boards. So I started to get a lot of calls during that time frame, And that's when I got on the, um, the Allergan board. Uh, that's, you know, it was a couple of years after that that NVIDIA called me. So I've never had to, but I, I try to advise people now, but I've been lucky that I never had to go out and, and position and sell myself. When I'm looking for more boards, I'll tell other board members around the table that I am. I'll tell headhunters that I know. And Interpublic Group was a really interesting one where there's a guy named John Wood who is at uh, Hydric now. Uh, I think it was Hydric who was there. But anyway, he knew me and uh, he followed me over the years and we stayed in touch. And when I left PepsiCo, he said to himself, geez, I've had Interpublic Group's been a client of mine. They didn't have a board search going on. But he said, here's this person who's had agency side work for 15 years in an advertising agency. And, and in fact, at the number one competitor on the com, and has been a client and run a marketing organization. She would be unique to serve on the board. And so he called me up and had me meet Michael Roth, who's the now chairman, executive chairman of the company, uh, just because it wasn't even for a board search. So that was sort of leveraging, you know, who, who you knew. Now what I'm doing is I'm, I'm trying to build portfolios. I, I have enough board work right now, but I'm always looking in the future to marry smaller, more entrepreneurial companies with large, big, and it, it, NVIDIA, when I joined, it was actually a small entrepreneurial company. It was like 3.8 billion uh, in revenue. So it's, it's much bigger and different now. But I think it's good to not just do all huge multinationals, to do some that are scrappy or more startup, because I think some of the things that you can learn and you apply to small, the, the small guys always want people who have large company experience because you can help them to scale and to scale in a smart way. But I think also the big companies can sometimes benefit from a little bit of more entrepreneurial, quicker thinking from a smaller board. So for a per time period, when I was at um, Parthenon, I did a lot of private equity diligence work for companies uh, buying uh, packaged goods sector companies, food service companies. And one of the companies I advised them on was buying Skinny Pop popcorn, which ended up being a really good deal for them. So when I left Parthenon, uh, just when I was joining the NFL, uh, they asked would I consider serving on the board. I mean, the company was 75 million in revenue, and maybe not even 50 million in revenue. And, um, and so it's very small, but I did it. I, I often do things because I like the people. I like the leadership. I like the category they're in. And uh, anyway, I was on it for a couple of years. We grew it to about a half a billion and sold it to Hershey. But I learned. I learned a lot in that year and a half, in that two and a half year period. I'm always, <laughs> I'm always someone who thinks that the, you can't stop learning. You can't ever think, I got it set. I've had a successful career. I'm telling you, what would made me successful 20 years ago at Pepsi probably wouldn't be the things that would make me successful now. I just think you have to keep learning, you have to keep growing, and part of your own career development and choice of boards and who boards should look at is, again, look for that diverse experience. Look for how you can learn from others as opposed to sort of getting, getting a board of cookie cutters or for you going and getting a portfolio of boards that are just all alike. Don, you were at Pepsi as the president and CEO of the North American business. Uh, we cannot not talk about Coke versus Pepsi. What is your favorite Coke versus Pepsi story? I, I, I was about to ask you about how you stole the NFL sponsorship deal away from Coke, but maybe there's something else. <laughs> oh, yeah, there, there's a few of them. Um, so, well, you know... I, I, you know why NVIDIA put me on their board? They say they said, you know, we're we're the small guy going up against the big guys. You've got that funky, you know, Pepsi versus Coke uh, uh, philosophy uh, or point of view. You'll you'll be great on our board. And it definitely, you know, the cola wars just create. A, I got an idea. I'm going to move faster on it. Uh, I see an opportunity. Go for it. Particularly when you're number two. What, what was the one of the rental car companies? Avis, we're number two, we try harder. I mean, there's something logically that makes sense to me to that. So um, one of the things I learned when I, when I came into Pepsi uh, is that 
Well, a, a couple of things, and they, they relate back to the Cola Wars. They also relate to the fact that sometimes innovation doesn't have to be completely new. It could be taking something that's been done before and refreshing it and doing it. You could define innovation all different ways. But when I came to Pepsi as the chief marketing officer and I came up through the non-carbonated beverage brands, and then I got you know, also to oversee the carbonated and the carbonated were struggling, not Mountain Dew so much, but Pepsi was struggling. And one of the reasons it was struggling when you looked at the data is that it, it had had this huge resurgence under Roger and Rico and it really reached out to the baby boomers. And then it kept marketing to the baby boomers. And in a way, at Pepsi, we used to say that Gen X was the lost generation. So I said, my job is to take this brand and reintroduce it to the younger generation. And to do it, I just went back to Pepsi's history. They hadn't been doing it for a while, but we were, you know, we were involved with, you know, music marketing before other people did music marketing. We were integrated in movies before people made movies. Uh, and so reached back out, signed some deals. So, you know, I have to admit I signed Britney Spears among others, but I also signed Beyonce. Um, so we had diverse talent. And then I decided to bring back the Pepsi challenge, right? And why did we bring back the Pepsi challenge? Because we knew that on a blind basis, more people preferred the taste of Pepsi versus Coke. But if you put a can of each in front of them and said, which do you prefer? More would have picked Coke, just it's the bigger brand, teaches the world to sing, whatever you wanna, wanna think about it. So I, I did want to use the Pepsi challenge to just try to say, hey, pause, think about it. And uh, so we bought it back in a, in a, in a fresh way. Uh, it worked. I, I never forget uh, being asked to go on Good Morning America to, sh to do the Pepsi challenge and about like sweating bullets. What if I go on national television and I don't pick the right one? What if they make me do it? Well, they ended up not making me do it, but um, I'm pretty sure I would have picked the right one, but that was a little nerve wracking. Um, and as it relates to the NFL, one of the other things that bonds people, particularly young people to brands is the things they are passionate about. And those obviously are sports. And we had relationships with the NCAA, we had relationships with baseball, we have relationships with soccer, tennis. We did not have basketball or football. Now we had college football, but with the big kahunas. So when the deal came up, or, or FIFA, when the deal came up for, um, uh, for to pitch the NFL, now the NFL is pretty sexy, right? And so, you know, I, a, a woman, I was chief marketing officer at the time, a woman going to pitch the NFL, I would normally get a lot of help from senior management on something like that because it'd be just too much fun to, to walk into the NFL and be pitching your business. But the way the Coke and Pepsi wars worked is that you had to pick your battles. Basically, we would both come to the table. And, and what you may not know is that Dr. Pepper uh, is, is rides on, you know, over 40% are on Coke trucks and 30% are on Pepsi trucks. And then they have their own truck system. So Dr. Pepper really wasn't a factor because they're going to go through the Pepsi or Coke systems. It's Pepsi versus Coke. So a restaurant comes up, uh, a deal for uh, a beverage company for sale comes up. We're both going to come and compete. And some of them we're going to decide we really want to win. And others, we're going to be a spoiler. We're going to go into it simply to bid the price up. So if the other guy has to pay more, then they can't bring as much money to the table on the next deal. So the assumption at PepsiCo was that we were going to be a spoiler. The Coke was going to renew the NFL, of course, but send Dawn and her, you know, her little you know, sports marketing group in, into the NFL and, you know, tell us what happened. Well, I, I didn't sort of realize that whole dynamic, and I took everything as an opportunity. So I said, I'm going to go in and give it our best shot. So working with a sports marketing agency and the team, I mean, there were like, there were like four or five of us. That was it, working on it. We came up with the idea that Pepsi is about entertainment and that sports is moving more and more toward entertainment. And what could two brands that stood for entertainment do and what could Pepsi bring to the NFL to bring more entertainment value to it? So we went in and said, make a big deal out of the start of your season, make kickoff 
a really big event. Make the halftime bigger yet. Do more music marketing, you know. So we brought a number of ideas that we could do both on a local basis and a national basis. And I think some of those ideas really hit home. I think it also really helped that on the beverage committee deciding who the sponsor would be was Jerry Jones. And Jerry Jones was a huge PepsiCo fan because Frito-Lay was in its back, backyard. And we always poured Pepsi at the stadium in Dallas. And um, so he kind of behind the scenes was giving me some advice too. We put a lot of money on, on the table and I, I never forget, I got the call and, and the head of sponsorship at the time was Roger Goodell, right? So Roger knows me, that's how I end up at, at the NFL years later. But Roger calls me and he said, Dawn, please, I, I have to call Coke and I have to do the reputable thing. I do not want this in the press, but I'm telling you we're selecting Pepsi. So I called Steve Reineman, who was then, then the CEO and I said, uh, you know, one, the size of this deal meant it had to go through the audit committee uh, of the board. So it was not a, not a small deal, it was a big financial commitment. So I had to get that through the board, but then I had to tell him, you know, we had won it. And he said, Dawn, you can't do that. You can't, we have to do something. We have to announce it, we have to let it leak because Coke's gonna back up, you know, 50 trucks of cash to keep this thing when they hear. We can't, I said, you know what? I trust Roger. I trust how we've done this. I trust the owners. I think that we're doing this on, on, on the grounds of what's best for both brands. You're just going to have to trust me and we can announce this tomorrow. And very, oh, I hoped I was right. I mean, I was going to get killed if I was wrong, but I was right. And then we were able, we were able to announce it. But I think as a result of that, that's one thing that led to my getting um, named president. Not that's just that, but Julius, if she can get that kind of thing done, I wonder what else she can get done. And that's little unreal. thing that's the thing I could get done is to give away $50 million a year through a procurement company. <laughs> that's unreal. You went in as a spoiler and then you ended up getting the, the deal. Unreal. Um, maybe we can just jump into, since there, there is that, that connection to the NFL, um, yeah, fast forward, um, what happened? How, how did you get the, the NFL opportunity? So um, Roger Goodell lived, at the time we did the Pepsi deal, uh, three blocks from me. He grew up in this little town called Bronxville, New York, and that's where we were raising our family. And so after we did the deal, I actually, you know, Roger at the time was, you know, executive vice president, then chief operating officer, uh, Tagli Boo was the commissioner. And when you do a sponsorship like that, in order to activate it locally, you still have to go and do deals with at least 50% of the stadium so that your beverage is poured in their stadium as well. So um, I got to know, you know, many of the owners over that course of time. And then when I left Pepsi and Roger was then, you know, named commissioner of the NFL, I didn't feel like I wanted to stay in touch. If I saw him in town, which was hardly ever, because he was hardly ever in town, I'd say hi. But I didn't stay in touch with him. Because I just thought, oh, I'll be somebody just hanging on his coat strings because he's commissioner. So um, I, I, I was in my office and I was two weeks away from, I mean, we'd already signed the deal, but from selling Parthenon to Ernst & Young and becoming an Ernst & Young employee. And my phone rang and it lights up and it's Roger. I haven't talked to him in seems like years. So I pick up the phone and I talk to him. And he said to me, Dawn, he said, I don't know what you're doing these days. He said, but I've decided I need, I'd like to have a senior woman on my staff. And I'd like it to be somebody who loves sports and knows us. And your name immediately came to mind. I have no idea what you're doing, but if, if you're not personally interested, can you help me find somebody? Because I know you know quite an infrastructure uh, of women who love sports. So I said, Roger, I'd be absolutely helpful absolutely will help you in the search to find the right person. Uh, and and I'll, I'll strongly consider it. You know, I'll think about it. And um, so he said, great. Oh, we chatted for 10 or 15 minutes. And, and he said, why don't, you, why don't you call me in a couple of days? Let me know what you're thinking. So I hung up the phone. Oh, I didn't hung. I mean, it's a cell phone. So I put the cell phone down on the table. And uh, I like, I, I, it, was, it was like a Friday night or something. And I was at, at our, our uh, weekend house at the time. 
and uh, now now it's where I am. It's a permanent house. But um, I uh, I went downstairs to some guests, and I said, "You're not gonna believe the call I got." And I could start thinking the wheels. Oh my God! Like this could be. I mean, I I like big marketing opportunities. I I'm hesitant over going to work for Ernst and Young. You know, great company, but it's not quite my brand. And also, Ernst and Young. Uh, has a very early retirement age policy too. So I didn't necessarily have a long run at Ernst and Young. And I started to think about it. I said, you know, this might be perfect, but it involved giving up this flexible lifestyle I had and getting back on a train and going into New York. And, uh, but my kids were both out of the, out of the school at the, you know, out of the, uh, out of high school at the time. So I thought about it. I went downstairs and everybody in the room says, you are perfect for that. That's great. And I said, yeah, I think, you know, this, this really could be just a, a great thing, fun to do. So uh, I called him the next morning at like 8.30 in the morning. And I think he was surprised to, you know, get a reaction from me that quickly. But he then said, well, I want you to meet some of my senior team. And, and I, I did it over the course of uh, like three or four weeks. And then he made me an offer. And I said, absolutely. I said, here's a problem, though. Your season started. I know you want me as soon as possible. But my mom who's been widowed for a long, long time, has always wanted to go to Africa. And I am taking her on a two and a half week trip on safari in Africa in October. And I, and I won't break that promise to her. And so he said, no problem. Just come back when you're done and, and work for us. He said, but I would ask you one favor. On your way to the airport, will you just swing by the NFL, come in, and we just need to put a face to you, to the marketing department. And I was, I was brought in to run marketing and to run the events department which ended up being incredibly interesting to me because it was about moving the Pro Bowl from Hawaii to Florida and making it centered around uh, youth football. It was about running the international games, um, not to mention, obviously, the, the Super Bowl making draft a big deal. So it's really, really, really a uh, fun, fun job. But will you come by and meet the two teams? We'll put them in the boardroom and you could say hi and go to the airport. So I did that. Now, if you've ever been in Africa, uh, and particularly on safari, there's not a lot of cell service. So flew through um, Belgium, on, on down to Africa, cell phone's gone. I mean, it was really a great experience. Two and a half weeks, no, no talk, you know. Maybe once you'd get one bar somewhere and you could, I could call my husband and say, you know, we're okay here. But it was, it was a great experience. During those two and a half weeks of disconnection, the Ray Rice video went viral. So when I landed back in Belgium on my way home and turned my phone on, it blew up with all these, you know, you're not gonna go there now. Oh my God, see what's happening. How can you dare go to be head of marketing for the NFL? And, and I had a very different reaction. And my, my, my reaction was, you know, when brands get under stress, there's an opportunity to make a bigger impact and you can actually drive more change. So, uh, you know, dived into it and we ended up being able to turn it actually into quite a positive thing where the NFL working with domestic violence organizations was able to shed light on something that, you know, is a major issue in this country and many others that doesn't get talked about. But uh, it, it was amazing how many people thought I would just turn and run, run from it. That's not me, I don't turn and run from things. It's uh, un unreal. I uh, I know Guru's got a question about about sort of the early. One thing, I, just two thoughts that come to mind is, you know, picking ENY and versus the NFL seems like, you know, two very different brands. But what could have ENY been had you joined ENY? <laughs> could have been a different company. I think I would have had a really terrific time at Ernst & Young. EY people are really smart, trying to change it up. They had a real commitment to diversity. Uh, there's a woman named Beth Brooke who ran it. I think I really would have bonded with a number of the senior leaders and I would have done more than just work on clients' businesses. I think I would have been part of thought leadership into how to you know, bring in the next generation of consulting talent. And um, also I think one of the things when you work for a hundred million dollar uh, consulting firm versus a five billion dollar consulting firm is the scale of the relationships. I spent so much time trying to get a company selling them on Parthenon because we were sort of untried and true. 
it's much easier to go to your board and tell them you have hired Bain or McKinsey to go do your work. It's another thing to go to the board and say, I hired Parthenon, or who are they? So the thing that EY would have done is made that selling part of it easier because they had a lot of relationships, they were known. And so I think I would have been having a, a, a higher percent of my time actually delivering the work. I'm sure I would have been really challenged by it. And uh, there's often, you know, if, if what I tell the people to think about it is there's a, you know, Robert Frost, there's a, there's a, a fork in the road and I took the one less traveled. Well, the other travel would have been fine. You know, you, you could have a fork, you can choose one way and don't feel like you're sacrificing. You will learn something from it and it may work out for you or you'll go back to the other, the other direction. I mean, today's way of building careers and today's opportunities are not as finite. You never, you know, unless you job shift every year for 10 years, you're not going to really make a mistake going and getting an experience if you learn from it. Don, uh, clearly your uh, your career was deeply impacted with sports and uh, you spent a bunch of time. Second? Yeah. One second. yeah. I'm, I'm going to put eye, my, I'm one okay. eye, yeah. eye so I don't blink too much. Yeah. Oh, good guy. This is like crazy. I feel like we can go on for hours. I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Kind of unreal. <laughs> Some great stories. Yeah. So. You know what I would tell you is yeah. if you think about it, is the decision I made to go with the NFL, what it did is it, uh, and you have to think about that, it shifted my brand. It took my brand, which had been a Pepsi brand, mm -hmm. and then it got, and if you will, a little sleepy while I did all these boards and these diverse things, and it re-energized my brand. And it did it around sports and entertainment, which was different than packaged goods, different than if I had gone to work for Unilever, or something like that. So it really renewed me in a way that I don't believe Ernst & Young would have done. Uh, and if you look then at the kind of boards I'm on, NVIDIA really works, it's technology. I'm now on a board in Sweden called Modern Times Group, which is in um, mobile gaming and esports. Again, I wouldn't be on that board if I hadn't done, done the NFL. So, you know, when door opens, when door closes, it can, it can lead to, to another place. But Don, I think that's super interesting to uh, talk about personal branding. Uh, I was going to ask you a, a different question, but it really, maybe if you can just talk a little bit about the importance of personal branding and it looks like you've been intentional about building it. Uh, how can one go, go about it, especially in the mid stage in the career, early in the career, maybe even later half of the career, how to start to, how to, how to think about that and execute on it? It, it is different because early on you're trying to build your brand. And then it, later on in your career, you want to keep, I think, updating and changing and keeping your brand contemporary. It's, it's interesting. I think I'd like to answer the question through one of my favorite activities that I did at the NFL was we had a group. We had a group. The reality is that the majority of players who play for the NFL are with the NFL less than three years, and then they go on to something else. And so we tried to have a supportive program, like an educational program to help players think about what's their stage two. They're all going to have, maybe not Tom Brady, but most of them are going to have a phase two career. How do you think about it? And how do you think about building your brand to set you up for that? So I got invited to teach at this uh, uh, program for transition, for people thinking about transitioning from the NFL. And I talked about personal branding. And what I talked to people about is, it's interesting because a lot of the players would say to me, first of all, I'd say, be really careful what you put up on your social media. Because first, think about, and, and players don't normally do this, or think about it, so think about what are the characteristics that you're most proud of, that when people ask to describe you, what do they say? Yes, they say you're a really successful linebacker, or you're an amazing wide receiver, but they also say you're really kind, or you give back a lot to the community, or you're a great mentor, or you speak so well, what are the things they say about you and that you want them to say about you? And then think about that, build your brand and say, how do I use my social media to not just share everything having to do with every catch that I made or every tackle that I made, 
but do bring the other sides and be very careful because if you're just smattering a whole bunch of silly stuff all over every social media platform you have, you're not building your brand. Like Richard Sherman is a guy who's been very active on Twitter for a long time, but he always, he's very cause oriented and he's always very equality oriented. And you know, you're going to get a consistent point of view from him. And he may tweet about something that, you know, great that happened in a place that he made, but he's often going to come back to his core perspective. So I, I tell people that to think about, and, and people in earlier on in their careers is think about who you want to be and use your social media to, to do that. Then from a career standpoint, as you're thinking about times in your career where you're gonna make a change, think about what are you trying, what capability, how, how are you improving yourself? To the same degree that you think about, do I wanna to go to Stanford Business School or Harvard Business School? Think about what's that company experience gonna do for me? What skills is it gonna give me? How are people gonna think differently about me as a result of that? And that won't factor into the only reason why you take a job or you don't take a job. But, you know, I had somebody call me this weekend and um, she recently um, left the NFL and she's had a lot of offers coming her way. And one of them is a very uh, a big name in sports. And what I said to her is, let's just think through if you do this, but you don't like it in two years, what's it say about you and what will you go on to do and what other jobs will open as a result of having done that versus if you did a job over here. I mean, to the extent that she's, it was her first job in sports and now she'll be taking a second job in sports, it's going to set her on a sports path. And so I think thinking about your brand and how you can be consistent, everybody says, I mean, it's so hard to build brands these days and everybody's bombarded with messages all the time. The successful brands have a very clear point of view and it's simple and they stick to it. And everything they do carries that perspective, that tone, that personality, that point of view, that cause orientation, whatever makes your brand. And it's really easy to try to attach a lot of other stuff to it, but in the end, it dilutes your brand. Just stay really true to who you are. So I think at my core, I'm an innovator. I have to be able to learn. I have to be comfortable with change. I have to open my eyes eyes to new things coming around. And that's what I think being an innovator and understanding um, market research, how generations shift, how values shift. That's, that's my calling card. I do that whether I've been on the agency side, the brand side, on a board, understanding change and how it's going and where it's going to create opportunities. So to me, I've always got to be true to my brand on that because that's what differentiates me. And so I try to help people understand for them, what are the things that differentiate them? And it's not just being a marketing executive. Staying on that note, um, just curious if you would add anything apart from the uh, points that you made about personal branding and thinking ahead, uh, a couple of moves ahead to before you choose your job. But if if you if uh, if, if a listener is a um, uh, is a is a um, uh, is, a, is a very uh, career-oriented uh, person, say, early to mid-level in, in an organization. Is there anything that would, you'd specifically point to uh, with respect to how they can make it to the C-suite, much like you did? And again, the part B to that question is, would that advice be any different, whether it's a male or a female rising star? Uh, the advice would be similar in terms of understand, one, I, I would tell people to, to look at the current company and look at where CEOs have tended to come from, right? So uh, if you're at a company that has almost exclusively promoted chief financial officers or marketing people into the C-suite and you're not in those areas, think about maybe you need to go to a company where if you're in um, operations or if you're in sales, it's more of a track. All right, so that's the first thing I think about. If you're at a company where there's a legitimate path for you to go forward, I, I look at, I, I tell people, try to think of range of experience. If I've been giving the advice to myself when I was at Pepsi and it, had I wanted to be CEO of PepsiCo, which I did not uh, want to do nor necessarily thought I was gonna be qualified to do, I would have said, I have to go overseas. The growth horizon for the company is much greater overseas than it is domestically. 
And I have to know the snack food business. That's a much bigger part of the profit performance of the corporation. So I think you need help to, to try to set, step back from your job, look at things in terms of what works and what drives the company and look to see if you can't diversify your experience at that company to get more of the experience that would set you up to be considered for a C-suite job. So, um, you know, people are often very uh, hesitant to, they're coming up through marketing or they're coming up through sales to do a shift into a different party organization. And I always encourage people that those are enormous opportunities for learning. That if you are in marketing and you get a chance to ask to go to sales, I'm gonna give you an example of this in my career. Um, you'll learn so much more from that outside perspective and you'll, that doesn't mean that you won't come back to marketing. It's just you're going to gain that experience. And I think that people who want C-suite need to look at building their portfolio of experiences to set them up. So at PepsiCo, one of the things I did try to do is participate in acquisitions. And I was lucky they invited me in, but I was very active in our acquisitions because that was a key part of growth. So whether it was Quaker or was then buying Izzy or something like that, I, I really the innovative part of me wanted to be involved in, in the acquisitions. The other thing I tell people as you're thinking about that is sometimes there's experiences you can get in a company that aren't directly your job description. And if you can get on some of these special task forces, like, like for example, when I was at Pepsi, we put a task force together. Steve Reidemann was on the board of uh, Johnson & Johnson. And Johnson & Johnson had a, had a real credo in what the company stood for. And he felt that PepsiCo didn't have as much of a credo. <coughs> Sorry. So he wanted to, to build what should PepsiCo stand for for the future. So we put a cross-functional team from all the divisions together to work on this at sort of mid-level, not the most senior level. That, um, that was a great experience for somebody that worked for me. And he learned a ton from it without having to shift jobs. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> All good. Take your time. I've been really good up until now. I've been starting to get dry, I guess. So hold on. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll also wrap up with, with one final question. I'm okay. <laughs> All right. So where were we? Um, the cross-functional oh, so, um, so special task cross force. Learning, sometimes it can be just volunteer to do something incremental that, yes, it's going to take more time and you can't do too many at once. But in doing that, you'll meet other people in other di divisions, departments, and you'll get an experience you can't get singularly through your current job. So when I was at Clairol, briefly early on in my career, I left advertising because I wanted to know what was it the clients knew on the other end of the phone or in Cincinnati, because I worked with Procter & Gamble, that I didn't know. And so I took a brand manager job at Clairol. And the day that I joined, they, uh, my boss, uh, John Doran, called me into his office. And he said, I see at the bottom of your resume here, it says you speak French. And I said, well, not fluently, but I, I spent uh, six months in France in college and I can make it. He said, good, we're doing a joint venture with a company in the south of France. And I would like you to be the brand manager on it. And oh my God, I was like 25 or 26 years old. My R&D department's in the south of France. Uh, I have to talk on the phone in French, which is it's funny. If you use your hands a lot, it's really, really difficult to just be on that phone describing things. And I did learn that the word for ass is really close to the word for neck. And if you're talking about making the neck of the bottle thinner, but you use the ass word, uh, it's very confusing to people on the other end of the phone. Anyway, phenomenal experience. Uh, my husband, I was young, and recently married, got a job opportunity in Chicago. And uh, as much as I love Clairol and I love that experience of taking an international brand of Clairon shampoos and conditioners and skincare from France, importing into the U.S., going only sort of high-end drugstores and department stores, different channel that I've had experience with. A year really wasn't quite enough, but I had to go to my boss and say, 
uh, I'm, I'm going to have to leave because I've, we've made a family decision to move to Chicago and you guys are based in Chicago. And he said, you know, Dawn, we've got a sales office in Chicago. Uh, would, would you consider uh, going and, and becoming a sales manager? And who knows, you guys might move back to New York and you can stay with the company that way and you get great experience. And I completely quickly dismissed it. I'm a marketer. I'm not a salesperson. I'm not doing that. And so I went to Chicago, I ended up going back into advertising and working in, in hair care again and whatever. I, I wonder, I often go back to that time that if I had, it was very innovative at the time, gone and stayed with Clairol and gone and seen things from the sales side, would I have become more quickly a better general manager with that experience? So my advice to people would be just don't knee jerk say no. Really think it through. Think about what it means in skill building. Think about it, what it means in your lifestyle, whether you like it from a lifestyle standpoint, and then think about what it means for your brand. Um, Don, I feel like we can go on for hours, and, and I want to be mindful of, of your, your voice as well. Um, you know, you've lived like 20 lives, I feel. Um, what's still left on the bucket list? What, what, what do you still want to experience and achieve? I always want to learn. So, and, I, and I'm not, I'm, and I don't like the word retirement. It's just not in my DNA because so much of I love to work. And, my, and work is creative, work is learning constantly, work is seeing opportunity. So, um, but I, I am gonna do it in a way, I'm, I'm never, not, I shouldn't say never, cause I surprise myself, but I don't think I'm going back to a nine to five job again. I, 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 keep, I keep getting calls, I'm, I'm not inclined to do that because I want my, my lifestyle. My husband's retired a lot longer than me and he's waited for me to be able to travel and do things and, um, my youngest daughter has a serious relationship and lives in Brooklyn and I like to be able to have time to go in and spend with her. And I also, um, we lost our older daughter. She died two years ago. And um, it really, really points to the importance of making sure that you do the things you wanna do in your personal life. And uh, so I'll, I'll always be that worker looking for more, but I'll always look at not doing it at the expense of my family and time with my family. So that said, um, I have worked in small boards. I've worked in big boards. I've worked at big companies. Maybe what I'm most excited about is helping uh, more than a startup, but a startup become a profitable company and see where it can go. I haven't done that before. And uh, it's a brand called, it's a company called The Draft Network. And it was started by a friend of mine's son with an eye toward intersecting younger sports fans like a lot more knowledge and technical knowledge than older sports fans. It feeds into their fantasy play. It feeds into uh, gambling if they're a gambler, but they, they like more data. And what we thought, what, what this person saw as an opportunity is to take more data around the income and class of college athletes and marry it with data around what the teams needed through having a lot of scouting professionals uh, on, on the payroll to write content and create a digital only platform. So it's a digital only platform. Uh, he was the founder and now there's a female CEO. Her name is Paige Damakos and she, she really, really rocks and really knows her football. Anyway, it's really just fun uh, to work on something that there's so many directions we can take it in entrepreneurial. So I would say that's, that's probably the next phase of my life is yes, continuing to do boards, but uh, seeing ideas through to reality. Awesome. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll end it here, Don. This is, this is unreal. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for, for, for doing this. Um, right. uh, we've got a lot of content. <laughs> that we can work with. Okay, good. Yeah, this was incredible, Don. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't cough <laughs> All right. No, no, I hope, I hope you're feeling all right. But um, yeah, we'll, we'll let you know. We're probably going to release it in, in May-ish um, and we'll, we'll give you a heads up. Um, but we've got a few more episodes that we're trying to record. But thank you so much for doing this. Okay, you're welcome. Thanks. Have a good Thanks, rest Don. of it. Where are you guys based? Uh, Palo Alto, Toronto. I'm in Toronto, yeah. Are you on the East Coast or West Coast? I'm on the East Coast. 
Japan, but I spent I used to spend a lot of time on the West Coast. Now, now I spend time on Zoom. But presumably, <laughs> I'll be <laughs> anyway, Toronto. All right. I Thanks, love, Don. I love Thank Toronto. you. Yeah. All right. Bye. You should come whenever you come. Let me know. I'll let you know. I used to I used to run um, for for the agency. My my big job break was to get to run Canada for Tide Laundry Detergent, the biggest brand. Oh. So I was in Toronto a lot, and I just love Young Street and that whole area. And I still, my husband, and I one of my favorite things is to go back to Toronto. I've done Montreal once, but but more Toronto right before Christmas. As people are traveling yeah, and, you, and uh, snowy. You're going to hit me up for the film festival. You should come out for that. <laughs> oh, yeah, the Toronto Film Festival is great. Anyway, thank you. Have a yeah. good time. All right. Thanks, John. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, it would mean so much to us if you could take a moment to share this show on LinkedIn. To learn more how Guru and his team can help optimize and grow your e-commerce business on Amazon and other retailers, visit commerceiq.ai. Thanks for listening.